Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Colin Mahan, and I'm a program manager at the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. For those of you who may not know, the NASDAQ Center is a nonprofit dedicated to enabling entrepreneurs from all over the world to realize their maximum potentials and grow. As you may have seen in the chat, the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center, along with our partner Mentor Cloud, launched a free mentor matching platform for entrepreneurs called Mentor Makers. Create your own advisory board to guide and inspire you with in the moment mentorship from topic experts and professionals dedicated to providing exceptional mentorship to entrepreneurs across all races, industries, and geographies. Find one today or become one today by using the link in the chat. Mentorship matters, as we know, to all entrepreneurs. Their success is dependent on it. Quick housekeeping item for you all. We will open up for live Q&A at the end of the event. So please submit your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen throughout the presentation. Also, if you have any comments that you'd like to put, throw those into the chat. We'll try to get to them. But again, if you've got questions, drop them into the Q&A because the chat can get busy. Again, none of what we do could be possible without all the amazing support from our sponsors, including NASDAQ, Lehigh University, Bank of the West, KPMG, Wilson Sonsini, Woodruff Sawyer, BPM, and NZTE. We're humbled and thankful by their contributions. Um, during these unique times, we're curious to learn how sentiment is among the entrepreneurs we work with. So we're gonna start by taking a poll to let us know how you're feeling about your business right now. So I'm gonna launch those. So let us know how you're doing. 2021 off to a strong start in many ways, but again, it still comes with challenges. So take a quick second to let us know how you're doing and we'll get started in a moment. The second question, what's keeping you up at night? helps us understand the needs of our community in real time. So here at the center, we like to provide education that's relevant for uh, the community who joins us on these awesome webinars. Um, so let's see, we've got a decent amount of you chiming in and optimistic, which is good. Um, and let's see, pivoting is uh, on the rise in the what's keeping you up at night, which is understanding and then followed by finance. So I'm gonna end that, share those results with you all. Optimism is at the top of the key, which is great. Surviving is um, obviously something that we can understand, anxious and fearful, both we can understand. So we're here for you. And with the next poll, what's keeping you up at night, finance and pivoting, Thanks for that. We've got some great programming around those areas coming up in the coming month. So tune in and join us. Um, last but not least, before we get started, um, share, us with, share with us in the chat. What are the hardest conversations you have coming up? Our topic today is making conversation with an amazing author that I'm going to introduce in one second. So let us know and we'll hopefully be able to address um, some of that real-time need with you guys and the conversations you have coming up. Now, without any further delay, please join me in giving a warm welcome in the chat to our special guest, Fred Dust, former managing partner at IDEO and current founder of Making Conversation and author of Making Conversation. Fred, let's jump right in, welcome. That's great, yeah, I know. And I was actually trying to think about like, what, what are the things that are coming up that I'm quite I'm nervous about. It. I'll have to think about that as well. So, Colin, I'll, I'll give I'll give some thought to that. Nice, nice to see you. Thanks for having so much. Um, I'm, I'm excited to have a conversation about a book about making great conversations. <laughs> I know it's. Um, a we've, got, we've got somebody in the chat that says conversation about a promotion, telling candidates we didn't choose them, ending a toxic toxic stress relationship. Ooh. Yeah, well, those, we can talk about all those things. Um, I mean, just so you know, like we're half, I'm open to talk about everything. Like I've talked about dating with the Harvard Club, and I can we can we can talk about um, pivoting. We can talk about firing. We can do all that sort of stuff. So amazing! Um, and knowing the takeaways from the book, I'm sure we will get to a lot of these amazing tips and tricks for all of our entrepreneurs out there. Um, so, Fred, you yourself have a unique journey that led up to writing this book. Can you explain a little bit about your path to where you are today and what drove you to writing Making Conversation? Yeah, you know, and it's, it actually, it relates a little bit to pivoting, um, to, to, be, to be honest. Um, so, you know, uh, up until about 2017, I ran one of um, IDEO's largest practices, Systems at Scale, which is focused on large scale systemic change. It was looking at politics, government, the nexus of business, private sector, foundations, and media. And, um, 
and um, was also the global managing partner. Um, and basically at some point um, right after, the last project I was working on with the government was with Vec Murphy, the Surgeon General. Um, in fact, I'm doing South by Southwest next week with him. So tune in for that. And, um, and uh, it was about isolation, loneliness in America. And I was actually helping design the conversations for town halls that would bring people together to kind of get through some of their anxiety and loneliness. Um, and he got fired as we know. <laughs> and, um, and I sat there and I was thinking, well, IDEO no longer can be, can, can afford to do the work I want to be doing because it's like we've sort of outpriced ourselves. And I was kind of like trying to figure out what, what's to happen, what happened next. I gave a lecture to Fast Company um, that was about how we lost the hardest conversations of our lives. Um, and I mean, the, the, hard, the ability to have hard conversations in our lives. And my agent called me up and was like, this is your book. So I spent a year, wrote the proposal, quit IDEO and sold the book um, the day after I quit IDEO and, um, and kind of did a massive pivot. You know, I, what, I, what I needed to do, Colin, was find out what was the company that I worked for and what was me. And that's really been the work I've been doing for the last couple of years is like understanding who I am. Well, you look happy, so the pivot must have been a good one, huh? And and it, I, I'm all for pivots. I'm like I'm like I'm I'm really happy. It's like it's like I've, I've, I don't think I've ever been happier to be honest. It's like we were just talking this call, and like I keep reading about like the going back to normal, and I'm like I'm not sure I'm ready for just entirely normal. Like it's like I'm I'm ready for a new normal, but but old normal would have had me on flights. I, I would have been a different city every day for the my um, for most of my year. So that's great. Um, our founders uh, talk to various stakeholders on a daily basis. And as all the comments of chatting with team members, having to let them go, um, why should people, uh, based on the takeaways from your book, why should people design conversations instead of just letting them happen? Yeah, and, and just Colin, to give you a little context on that, like I'm not suggesting you, you design every conversation you have, right? So it's like chit chat, gossip, late night whispering, that kind of stuff, like that's great, keep on doing that. That's like the stuff of life. It's the stuff, there's really three conversations that I kind of think about that are that really need to be designed. One's where you have to have something happen. There has to be an action that comes out of it, which um, not all conversations are for that. Um, and it's really clear that we need to, we need to know that. The second is whenever there's difference in the room. And so any indifference, you know, is, can be anything. It can be um, like, I talk about Weight Watchers. It can be someone who's larger than you, younger, younger than you, thinner than you. It can be, but it also can be somebody who's a different, you know, um, different color from you, a different different uh, culture from you. So those need to be thought of carefully um, and, and thoughtfully. And then the third that I think are some of the things that we're hearing in the chat are the ones that give you a pit in your stomach like where you basically, you have fear, real fear about what's coming up. And, um, and those, you really need to be really careful to be thinking about how to kind of design those and treat those creatively. And one last thing, Colin, the general premise of the book is conversations are the most important tool, non-lethal tool that we have to resolve conflict and to kind of make things happen in the world. Um, like we should be treating them like as though they were a creative act unto themselves, not just like something that happens because the reality is like, you don't let just, you wouldn't let a dinner party happen. You wouldn't just like, like make a travel plan without making a travel plan. But often we don't make plans for the hardest conversations that we have. Totally. And in the book, you talk about how now our conversation, a lot of conversations are on our devices. Yeah, and as you know, I'm I'm actually not um, uh, I'm not um, anti-device. Like it's like I, I I feel like I feel like I'm really I'm like I'm like I'm like I'm I'm like pro different mediums for different kinds of conversations. And one of the things I write about at the end of the book is this whole section on how to have the hardest conversations of your life during a pandemic. Um, you know, over, over Zoom, and. Um, uh, because I had to write that in March, they like my publisher was like, "You got you got an afternoon to write that chapter." But um, I'm I'm not anti technology. I don't think that's what's brought us down. I think honestly, it's a, I think it's the news hook that's done it. I think it's like it's kind of it's kind of because the news hook wants to talk about divide. It wants to talk about conflict. It wants to tell you about all that, all the hard things. It doesn't want to give you good things. Um, and so we really need to kind of like, as someone said, lean, lean on facts, um, make sure that like we really are working on understanding um, what's the truth around things. That's amazing. Um, so in the book, you talk about some of the things that cause conversations to break down. What are some of those things to help our audience today? 
Yeah, I mean, things, there's so many reasons. There's physiological reasons. Like, so there's exhaustion, there's like time of day, th th things like that. There's the fact that some of our conversations are inherently unfair. Um, so I'll, I'll give you an example of one that, um, or, or, or where the power balances are, are way off or where people can't agree on terminology. What That's one of the most frustrating ones that we actually see. Um, one of the hardest conversations that I used to have to, that I still do have to engage in frequently is to give critique. Um, and, you know, I'm a designer, I've had to give critique almost every day of my life. I myself have, re have received vicious critique in, in architecture school. Like that's actually like, it's, 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 not, it's not a great culture of critique. And um, I, what, what I recognize is that I had the power in those contexts, right? So it's like, so when I would go in with design teams, I would basically say, I'm gonna hand the power over to you. What's, what are the stuff, what are the things I can't touch? Um, what are the things that like you really need help on? And then you're gonna hand it back to me and then we're gonna work on the things you really wanna help and I, I help on and I'm not gonna to touch the stuff you don't wanna to touch. Um, which also I will say, and this is true for you all in there, it's like that um, when people, if, if, if you feel like you can't have a conversation that day at that moment, it's okay to say, I just can't do this today. Um, it's like, it's, it's gonna to have to happen, but it just can't happen today. Um, so I, I think I think that really matters. Somebody had writ written earlier about, um, sorry, I just thought it was interesting. Some sort of getting people to engage in authentic, genuine, and honest, meaningful conversation. Um, and and I'm, I'm really interested in that. Colin, would you be willing for me to chat a little bit about that? It's yeah, I mean, in real time. Yeah, I get great. Um, it's a, um, one of the things actually interesting, Michael, is that, um, one of the first chap chapters, by the way, there's seven C's in the book, which suggests it's a methodology. It's not, it's an approach. Um, so mostly what I'm trying to do is inspire you to think about the ways that you can do things that feel, that feel, that feel right to you. And that relates Michael to authenticity, right? Is that it's like, it's like, don't, don't go out and do my book, go out and do you thinking about how to kind of create a creative conversation. That's, that's the, that's the best thing that you can do. Um, I think that, one of the first chapters commit is about the idea of committing first to the people in the conversation and actually holding your ideas more lightly. So Michael, ironically, it's, I mean, it's not about like just getting your ideas out there and making sure that they're, they're, that they're really clear or for that matter, hiding your ideas. It's just sort of saying, I've got ideas, I have values, but right now, Colin, I'm committed to you. Michael, I'm committed to you. You know, it's like, and, and I really wanna kind of have the conversation that you wanna be having. And, and that's, that's, that's the important thing. And I always say like, if you can't commit, don't. Like, you know, it's like, if you guys have other stuff to do right now, by all means, like hang up. <laughs> like, it's like, it's like, it just makes more room in your life for the things that need to happen. One last thing I'll say, Colin, is often what I really find frustrating is when people are like, you know they're not committed to the institution or the organization or whatever, but they sort of say, they, they keep saying, oh, you know, I have to be here because it's helpful to have the naysayer in the room that doesn't believe in the message or doesn't believe in the, in the institution. And I'm like, not so sure that's true that we, we actually need you here. It's like, so I'm like, I'm like, maybe you should think about stepping off the board if, you, if that's the way you feel. Or maybe you think, at the end it's like, if, if you can't commit, the naysayer doesn't necessarily always help us. Totally. Um... So speaking of constructive conversations, uh, can you give us an example of a conversation that had a meaningful impact? Um, for me, well, like when, when, when the, the, the um, boy, like um, I'll, I'll tell you about a conversation I had that had a, um, that, that has meaningful, that wasn't, that didn't have words in it. So um, my mother, was a really phenomenal listener. She had like what I call like resting nice face, um, which is sort of like, hey, um, come on, talk to me. I like, I'm, I'm open and curious and interested. And I sort of inherited that and, I, and to great advantage. I love it. Like, it's like, I, I love having the resting, the resting nice face. Um, and um, just amazing communicator. And when I was 24, um, she had a serious stroke and was left um, uh, paralyzed as well as um, aphasic. And for those of you who don't know what aphasia is, aphasia is, there's many forms of aphasia, but her form of aphasia was one where she, you, we believed that she knew what she wanted to say, but she couldn't get the right words out. Um, or we believed that she could hear what we were saying, but she couldn't quite, her, her, her brain was crisscrossing. Um, and so that wasn't happening. And so 
for me, one of the most meaningful conversations of my life was when my mother woke up out of a coma and we began to realize that she would never really be able to communicate in the same way again um, in, 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 in that. And that made me realize that my whole job on, on, on the earth was basically to go have conversations with everybody and get to know everyone that I can while I could, because I knew I had a time limit on, my, on myself. So um, it's kind of a dodge because it's not really a conversation. It's kind of the exact opposite of a conversation, but it's a, um, but it, it, it was still kind of one of the most meaningful moments of my life that, that, that affected the way I think about conversation. Well, I mean, talk about the reality of needing, uh, you know, people in this world, right? And uh, sorry to hear about your mom. I dealt with the same thing as my dad when he couldn't speak, but he understood things, so I read Well, that's really interesting. You know, it's like, as you know, like men almost always, the, the thing that's hit, hit the hardest when they have a stroke is their communication function, which is really fascinating. Um, women, it's a little rarer, um, so it, it, it would be really interesting. I definitely would like to talk about this notion of the competitiveness in conversations, um, because I, I feel like, um, uh, this is this is a real this is an issue right down to the way that we see kind of public debate happening um, in in the U.S. Um, even what we just kind of like the things we witnessed during um, the elections and 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 to up, right up till now, um, yeah. I, I, competition again. When you think about it as our most valuable tool, it, it is not about competing ideas. It's 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 about figuring out where there, there's commonalities and how you can actually help each other. And so. One of the things that I, I really, one, one of the tools that I built actually was a thing called Creative Tensions. I don't know if anyone's come across it before or, or experienced it, but Creative Tensions was built, to be honest, Colin, it was built as a dating game. I was like, I was like, okay, enough content from IDEO. I was just like, can we just like get people together and have them like find the person that they love or they want to hook up for with a night or for one night. So we built this thing called Creative Tensions, which is where you would put up these two tensions, like I'm more silk, I'm more corduroy, or when police are around, I feel safe, when police are around, I feel unsafe. I mean, these kinds of tensions. Um, and people would move back and forth across the room. And I would then ask them, hey, can you guys explain why you're in this spot? And they would they would tell you a little story about why they were more silk or more corduroy. Um, by the way, the answer to that question changes geographically and globally, depending on where you are. So it's like, it's quite fascinating, you know, it's like, um, uh, um, if, if you do it in India, there's a, there's a lot more silk than corduroy, you know, for instance. So, um, but what was interesting was to see um, how once people started to define their terms, they actually found more agreement with each other and could find the ways that they would connect. And, and my, my big point was, we are always in creative tension. Like the biggest thing we need to do is talk about those tensions and recognize that tension is in fact a generative tool for us. It can actually help us build really amazing things. So I'll give you the most powerful example of that was I did one at BAM that was focused on victims of black, uh, of police, police officer violence. And I, I put that tension up, the one that was like, when police are around, I feel safe and I feel police around, I don't feel safe. And um, at that point, everyone in the room went to one side, except for one black woman whose son had been killed by a police officer. And I, asked her her story. She told me the story and I stepped down from this two-step podium and um, went over and just was like, I'm so sorry. And, um, and then three black police officers came over and they hugged her and they were like, I realize I'm afraid because I have, I have black sons and I worry about them every day getting killed by police officers. So I don't have anything else to say. <laughs> no, I mean, that's that's an amazing story. And uh, I would assume that the police officers were on the unsafe side. The police officers were on the safe side until they went to the unsafe side. Oh, so yeah, wow. She was on the unsafe side and she yeah. was alone and then they, they, they moved. And, and that was a great example where something so powerful had happened that all we could do was just say, okay, everyone, something changed in the room. And that's a big thing I, I write about as well, is the ability to acknowledge when something changes in a room. So when an idea is like so good that you're like, oh wait, this is something we have to pay attention to or something that's been so moving that you have to stop and pay attention to it. And it's a really important thing, especially as entrepreneurs, is to kind of get really good at knowing when change happens, noticing it, because that's that's a really powerful tool um, as, as, you, as, you, as, you, as you think about it, so. That's great.
Um, so while we can't get into all seven of your book's elements for designing conversations, what are some of the most important and uh, neglected elements? Yeah, well, so um, chapter two, which was the book, which is the chapter that I wrote to get the book sold, which um, uh, is why it's actually, I think, the least well written because it's actually a bit long. Everything else gets, it gets easier. I think you're in the middle of a column. It gets way, way quicker as you go along. It's 200 pages. It's easy. It's like, it doesn't take much time. But um, chapter two is called Creative Listening. And um, it was it was a really pivotal one. In fact, at first, my agent was like, I think it, it could just be all about listening. And I was like, we have more to say than just listening. Um, but um, but a lot of it actually was writing, I wrote about, it was written originally as a response to the idea of active listening, which is just kind of like nodding along and saying, uh-huh, that's, you know, that's, you know, that's, that's good. Although Colin, it's a good interview technique because often if you do that, like you'll get me to say things that I might not say otherwise, because I'll just kind of ramble on and then, and, and, and whatever. So <laughs> But, but active listening ironically originally began in um, Rogerian therapy. And it was this notion that in therapy, if Freud and, and Jung couldn't solve every problem, right? And so by kind of just nodding along and saying, uh huh, please go on, gradually I would waken up and I would discover my own problem. Um, and so, and by the way, that wasn't the only kind of therapy um, Carl Rogers. Um, did he, he did many kinds of therapies, but it was one kind for some some kinds of his patients. Active listening really got um, co-opted into the workplace. It's often the it's the it's the it's the way that we think about leaders listening. It's the way we think about um, HR listening. Um, we actually make listening into kind of a punitive act. Often we will say things like, "I'm going to go give everybody a li good listening to," or "or I have no choice but to listen." You know, it's like it's like it's like or or they had no choice but to listen. And the reality is like that doesn't make listening sound very fun or like something that you really wanna be doing. Um, and so basically I really encourage you to think about other kinds of listening. Um, I, I talk about, especially as entrepreneurs, here's a really nice way to think about it is I, I, there's a whole section about Quaker listening that's about why to listen in silence, but listening to yourself at the same time. So hear what your, what your own body is saying while you're hearing somebody else. And the reason that works is that if you look at the theory and psychology of creativity, we make associations when we're in silence um, that we don't make otherwise. That's actually, and so it's why you have, you have like genius ideas in the shower. So it's why like, if you listen to your people maybe in silence for a while, which you may not be used to, especially if you're a leader, you might be like, I've got to tell them what to do. Then you'll kind of make associations that you wouldn't make otherwise. Um, and, and that can be really a, a really powerful, powerful tool. Another one that I talk about a lot, that's one of my favorite parts of the, of the, of, of the work is, um, how to tell the perfect super short story, which um, in the book I call Illuminations. Um, and is it okay if I kind of tell you how to do that? Oh, I love it. Um, and I was just gonna make a, a joke that uh, the active listening uh, from Freud and whatnot, like, should I have a notebook during these presentations? And yes, yes, Fred. It's like, it's like well, it's funny, I actually, um, I encourage you to have a conversation notebook, which is actually to watch the places where you see conversations go awry, watch where they go really well, watch who, like something that you, where you were able to change something so that you can actually begin to kind of practice those things. Like it's like, and in fact, notebooks, doodling, um, not taking like thorough notes, like not typing notes, but like kind of like writing whatever, um, sewing, um, needle pointing, knitting, those kinds of things actually tune our listening even better. So we actually, there's, there's research that suggests or says that we, we will listen better if we're actually kind of like doing little things. And so I take notes, but they're really, I, I never read them again. They're randomized kind of like little diagrammatic stuff, but it's- um, I'm a big proponent of paper. I, I yeah. have to have a paper notebook. I agree with that, except for I do, I'm gonna do a little plug for Remarkable. I do like Remarkable. Oh yeah, I thought about <laughs> It's like, you know, honestly, it's like, a, um, it's, it's been kind of amazing. Sorry, not to, not to do a little product promo while, while we're up here, but, um, but um, I, although I'm not taking notes on it tonight, right now. Um, so Illuminations, by the way, if you've ever seen David Kelly talk, I've, I, I used to have to interview David Kelly quite a bit and he, um, he does what he calls bird walks where he'll go way over here and then gradually come back sometimes and then he'll, he'll, he'll get to the point. So apologies, I learned unfortunately too much from David Kelly. And um, I am um, a lot of great stuff from David Kelly, I have to say. Um, so 
in the book, I have this two page chapter, I think it's two pages called Illuminations. And it's about how to tell the perfect story in 20 seconds that, um, um, that, that, that surprises and reveals something about you. And so I'll tell you the, who taught me this and, and tell you the story. And Michael and Colin, why don't you think about a perfect illumination that you can tell me while I'm talking? Cause you know this story, so I, I, you can give some thought to what this is. So my great grandmother was a, um, still, she was a founder in the steel mills. She, um, she actually, uh, uh, not a founder, she was a, whatever they call it. She worked in the foundry, but she, um, she didn't leave after World War II. She liked it too much. And so she worked at night and then had a farm by day. And one morning, as the story goes, she was coming home and she's walking down the, the long lane to her farm and gradually a blue something started coming into the, her, her, her center line of sight. And then it kind of got closer and closer. She had no idea what it was. And then it was sexy Jesus and he winked at her and she had the power to go on. So that to me is the perfect story because it's 20 to 30 seconds. You learn a lot about her, right? You learn that she was a, about her work ethic. You learn that she was a woman of faith. You, you, you learn that she wasn't willing, she was, wasn't afraid to have sexy Jesus, you know, show up um, if, 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 if you need. And it ends with a twist. You have no idea what happens after that. It leaves you hanging. Um, and it just gets your mind going. You're like, oh my God, I've learned all these different things about this person. So I really encourage you to practice these illuminations or practice people using these illuminations. And they're really helpful in the workplace because they're ways to kind of break through barriers that you might not know otherwise. They're great in interviews. You know, it's like to kind of ask somebody to kind of like give a 20 second illumination that makes you laugh, you know, or give, give them prompts. They're also really great ways to shut up that friend who goes on for four hours long and then well, with their with their story and is basically angry at you every time like you um you uh, um, try to interrupt them. Colin, do you have an illumination for us? Oh, on the fly. <laughs> um, let's see. Well, first of all, I think, yeah, we heard a founder last week talk about how nobody really resonated with his pitch until he, his last slide, which is talking about his father and why he had started his company. Um, so the guy passed on Tim Fer Tim Ferriss passed on the guy, but he said, why didn't you start with the story? Interesting. So yeah. he, he reframed his pitch and then went on to raise a decent amount of cash. Yeah, um, no, I had a founder last week who was giving me the pitch and I was like, and he was, it's about children's newspapers teaching six to nine year old ethical journalism. And I basically was like, and he's talking about these newspapers and the kids, and I, and I was like, take down your pitch show me the newspaper and then like and it was like and it was by far like i was like i was like okay now i'm into the product like it's like it's like so so i that's an interesting thing colin don't be afraid sometimes to stop a pitch and be like okay oh, here's something you can do that would be better um which actually might help them kind of like open up in a different way totally um so do you do you want me to give it a shot does, I, does everyone else want to hear I, I, I gave you so much time to think of something so go for it yeah well you brought up your grandmother which is interesting because uh my family comes from tracy sixth generation californians uh my grandfather and grandmother built houses from the ground up just them they uh, taught my father how to draft it on paper uh and when he was 12 to 16, he was also helping build. So child labor laws weren't a thing back then. <laughs> uh, my dad met my mother, who's all, who they both became engineers. And um, then my dad had me and my brother. My grandfather built buildings. My dad helped them stand up longer. My brother builds restaurants and I help build businesses. <laughs> We're all builders. <laughs> Boy, I can't wait to see what comes next out of that. That's fantastic. It's a, it's like, it's like, it's, a, it, it, yeah, I, I think that's remarkable. Um, uh, good job, Colin. Thanks. <laughs> um, and currently my dog Leo builds holes in the backyard. So, you know, there's yeah. that. Th three month old, right? Is that, is that, is that how old? Yeah, he's a little guy. Super sweet. Um, so a lot of people in the chat were asking about helping them have difficult conversations with employees. Um, I get retaining them, closing more deals. Um, how do you, how do you suggest that they um, make more meaningful conversations around? This yeah, one? I mean, it's like what's interesting. So, like, 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 let's let's go to the closing more deals one, which comes up quite a bit. Which is that um, it's funny. I just I think I told you. I just I interviewed for my first public board, and what was funny is that um, the CEO was like, 
my first question is how can I hire eight of you to sell my product for me? And I, and I was, I was like, that's, that's actually quite funny. Um, which I'm actually out there selling their product, whether or not they get me on the board right now. So I think it's so cool. But, um, I think, um, one of the things I think that, that really matters here is, um, both for the closing deals and actually dealing with your uh, employees is really trying to showing up, show up as you. So I'm, 53 years old, like it's like there's there's I, I wore jeans in the White House. I, I realized at some point I, I, I did my first interview right when I left IDEA because I, th I thought I wanted like a real job and I um I wore a suit and realized I just can't do it. Like if I wore a suit, like I, I would I would fall apart. So I think it's really important to show up as the authentic version of you. And some sometimes that's you in a suit. Like that's that might be the, what's comfortable. But sometimes it's like for me, it's jeans and you know a t-shirt and a, and a, and whatever. But um. So I, th I think that's one of the most first and most important things, um, it, both as a leader and as a salesperson, because what's interesting, and I was talking about this with the, this company, um, what we're finding is that it's like, if you're a black investor, um, you often want to find somebody who can give you financial advice who might be, who has similar kind of like background to you, right? It's like that, that, that you're, you look for people who you can make an authentic connection with because you, you want those kinds of trust. So I really would say like, you have no choice. You are yourself. So be yourself. I think, I think that that would really help. Um, uh, and then I, I would say with your, um, with the people who are, who are who are your potential clients, closing deals, you should treat it the same way you would treat your employees in essence, which is basically saying something like, tell me where you wanna be in five years, regardless of this institution. I used to do this with IDEO all the time. I'd be like, forget IDEO, forget me. Where do you wanna be in five years? And how can I, how, how can I help you get there? Um, and what that, which is, a, by the way, it's a great interview question. If you're actually gonna be, if you're interviewing somebody, it's a good, it's a good question if you're being interviewed. And you can say, I think you should ask me where I want to be in five years. Like it's like you can ask them to ask you that question. Um, but I think it's a great thing. It's a great thing to actually do when you're when you're talking to your consumer because what it says is like, for, I might not be the right thing, and I'm going to tell you, right? So Fred Dust may not be the thing that's going to solve your problems, but here's somebody who might. But just if you can tell me what it is that you want to do, then we will make sure you find the solutions um, that, that 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 you need in one way or another. And so I would say that's a it's a it's a question that kind of unpacks it a lot for a lot of different people in, in a lot of different ways. So that's that's one I, I really work on a lot. Um, there is there is one there was one question that talks about dissenting views and conversation, which is 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 resonant in so many ways. I wonder if Colin would be worthwhile for us to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, let's do it, Michael. You're killing it, or Michelle, you're killing it. Yeah, Michelle, it's like, woo, it's like, it like, it's like, are you, I think you're going after Colin's job. I don't know. It's like, it's like, so it's like, but, or mine, I don't know. And um, so dissent is okay, first of all, but one of the things that I often sort of try to do is not, what, what isn't okay is trying to solve dissent immediately. Like trying to do it in, in the single conversation. So let's, let's take a more fraught context like politics dissent in politics and a neighbor who might have voted differently than you right um i, I have i have those um I, I live in rural maine um i had a day where i was i had a guy who was hunting on my property different candidate on his truck um and i was like soon being like hey if i can talk to like an ex-president about why they need to get on zoom i can actually talk to this hunter who's hunting my property and so i just went up to him and i was like Hi, my name is Fred. What's your name? What's your son's name? And I was like, um, hey, just so you know, we have a, we have kids and a dog um, playing around on the property right now. So just be careful. Um, I, I, I bet, but also just ask in the future, if you don't mind, when you're going to hunt my property, because I would love venison, like if you would bring it. And so that, by the way, was the beginning of a long conversation. Like we've had these conversations now over and over and over and over again. Um, and we're, we're getting towards a place where we can be understanding and agreeing without actually kind of like, um, kind of like finishing the conversation all at once. The other thing I often talk about Michelle in this notion of dissent is that um, if you can't talk, if it's so extreme, and this is great for an entrepreneur, um, then don't talk and just do together. So like just make something together work together like that actually builds bonds in different ways um and so those kinds of things really can help as you start to kind of really kind of kind of connect in in a, in a in a more real way i love it and going back to your uh point on the where do you want to be in five years i would imagine that conversation or i guess question 
would you ask as an entrepreneur the investor where do you want to be in five years or do you ask the investor where do you want your portfolio companies to be in five years well i if i were if, if i if the, and for the investor i would basically suggest to them that i would if, if they've been asked that they're not very good investors so i feel, I feel like they, that you should be making sure that they're asking that question i think it's a really good thing but i i have a i have a friend right now who's up for a hundred million dollar um grant um and she's a she's a finalist among six uh hundred million dollars is a lot um and um and and she's gonna go she has a 30 minute final pitch but she has five minutes to talk about the, the what, what she's doing and then and then the pitch this is a this is a nonprofit, and i was looking at her board i, I know some people on her board and, and i was like these people are like luminaries in 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 the world in behavioral science luminaries in technology luminaries i mean like they're they're really it's, it's a board of a foundation and my suggestion to her was like take your 30 minutes and say i got 30 minutes with you guys you know more about how to solve these problems like and or how other people have can solve problems like this than anyone else i would really like to just hear from you what i should do like what, what do you think i should be doing or who amongst the other six who are who i'm pitching against should i be collaborating with who could help us kind of make our our, our, our thing work in a, in a really significant way but i'm like hey you got 30 minutes with luminaries hear from them ah gender difference michelle a lot um, so there, there, there is psychological evidence, although things are changing. I have to say, we're, I, I have a neuroscientist on my on my team, and we're we're continually following the neuroscience of conversation because things are, are changing fairly radically because of the pandemic, because of the ways that we sleep, because of the kind of roles we've been forced ourselves into, like um, like so what happens suddenly if you are a stay at home father. Um, so I, I think that we're actually seeing, and and I will say, we're seeing generations of men. Um, who are coming through like Gen Z that, that are actually like, I'm really excited to see, frankly, kind of in, in the world who have a level of, um, of sensitivity and connection. Um, like my team is entirely Gen X and Gen Z. And I have to say like the, the level of kind of love and unfortunately, I mean, I have to remind them all that we're not in love, but we're actually colleagues um, because it's like, we're, it, it can feel like love, but it's not. Um, uh, though I, Colin, there's days where I'm like, I, I'm like, like my one of my guys, went on vacation on Friday and just told me like last minute and I cried. <laughs> I cried for it because I was like, I'm gonna miss him for the next four days and why didn't he tell me before? But it's like, whatever. So, but, um, but uh, so, so Michelle, I, I, there have been traditionally notions, for instance, that you have to be more careful with humor um, that, that women um, have, respond differently to humor than others, um, than, than, than men. Um, not always the case, however. You know, it's like, it's like I, have, I have a young woman who's amazing. She's my design strategist. She's also a conflict negotiator and she can ride a motorcycle and shoot an AK-47, um, who, um, who the only way that I can actually get her to kind of make a point like in 45 seconds, as opposed to like a list of 10, you know, 10 minute long list is to kind of do a little bit of teasing and she's, you know, she can laugh at herself. It's actually quite funny. So it's like, so I just think it's like, Michelle, the best thing to know is like, not to, I'm going to tell you an interesting story actually, but, but not to get caught up on, on what you might think would be the dividers, but actually get, we're just better at really knowing who, who the people are on your team so that you know, or, or people that you're working with, so that you kind of kind of get a sense of how to make a connection with them as a, as, as a human in an authentic way. Here's my Colin, do you have, mind, mind if I do one more little ramble and then I'll stop? Oh, I love it, yeah. So one of the things that I used to do is a thing called, um, uh, it was, it was, a, it was a, a, um, a, a little thing called, um, who, who, am I, who am I anyway? Right? And basically it was like 10 pictures of someone's consumer and you would basically look at them and you would guess their age, their name, their gender, their race, um, their class. And um, then you would identify the single need that really needs to be important. Um, that, 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 they, that they have. And as one of the people who did it, and so I would use Instagram and I would use Instagram of my colleagues and me. Um, and so for instance, for me, they would always, they would always look at my Instagram, um, which I mean, you guys should look at it. It's FD Brave. I'm curious if you can see this. And they, they'd be like, this person is a, um, is a lesbian farm blogger who um, is a mess and can't keep their lives together because like their, their house is always dirty and dusty. And, 
and um, was probably a sex worker and is in her 70s. And so like, no, no joke, that would happen. Or, or like, or this person's a prostitute. And like, literally, they, like the stuff that would come up would be like ridiculous. Or like the, the, all of the, the gender markers, all those things were always off on, on my Instagram account. Um, now, unfortunately, because of the book, I have more photos of me. I didn't used to like to put photos of myself up there. But, um, but what's interesting is they were like, this person goes back and forth between a small house in Manhattan and a farm upstate um, in New York. What they really need to know is what's in the refrigerator of each place, so they're not having to duplicate stuff as they're as they're packing things up. And Colin, everything else was wrong, but the the need was right. I needed to know it was in the refrigerator. I just needed a fridge cam. <laughs> it's like it's just like straight up. I need to know what was in my refrigerator. So um, that's 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 a great example where I think it's like you might be surprised. That's a great story. Um... Let's see, we've got Q&A coming up in a little bit, but wanted to touch on a couple of points from takeaways from the book before we get to those. So drop your questions in the Q&A and keep them coming in the chat. We love this. Um, and Fred's being really good at just yeah. reading them off. Um, one thing, Fred, that as I mentioned at the beginning of this and as it's one of our core tenets of the, at the center is mentorship. Um, so can you talk a little bit about a mentor who influenced you, who gave you a chance um, and maybe some conversations that led to that relationship? Yeah, I'll give, I'll give you a couple. Um, David Kelly was a strong mentor as was, was Bill Moggridge of, of, of um, IDEO. Like they, they both, like I was an architect. I was the first architect at IDEO. Um, nobody knew how to review architecture. And so Bill was like, I don't know, I'm gonna have to figure out how to review you. So um, he's the one who taught me the rules of review because he was like, it could be wrong, but let's, let's do this. Um, David Kelly would always just come to me and he's like, he's like, you're going to leave, you're going to leave. <laughs> he's like, he's like, and, and you, you probably need to go, but it's like, so, so I'd say like, th those are, those are obvious ones. I, I mean, David, even did when I left was like, I told you so. I was like, David, it's 19 years later. And he was like, yeah, but I told you, you were going to, you were going to leave. Um, he was, he was, he was a great mentor. Um, the prime minister of Greece, George Papandreou, who kind of um, led Greece through the crisis is a dear friend of mine. I actually worked with him really closely during the Greek crisis. He's been a longstanding kind of mentor to me on, on dialogue and how to, and the democracy and dialogue. Um, Vivek Murthy, um, who's Surgeon General, way younger than me. And like, I don't know, he's like 41, I don't know, but it's like, it's like, um, has been like a remarkable mentor. I've learned so much from him. And then another one has been Mary Gentili, who wrote this book called Giving Voice to Values, who wrote a book on whistleblowing um, and, and how to kind of do that. And it's a kind of very counterintuitive story on what, how people kind of stand up to power in the, in the workplace, which is really about just kind of doing it in your own voice. Like, don't, don't try to, don't, don't be the whistle, like don't pull a whistle. So for the people who are asking about being an introvert, like she's, she identifies as an introvert. And yet, so she'll, she'll just like, one of the things she'll say, like if somebody's like telling a racist joke, she's like, okay, I think we just need to move over to, to get back to work um, right now. And she'll just like do simple things that she feels like she can do. One of the things she says in the book is that most people have asked don't identify as courageous. Um, and so you, you, need, you, need, you need to think about those kinds of things. I'll also say that I know a lot of introverts <laughs> who are surprisingly not intro as introverted as they think they are. So it's, it's kind of a fascinating thing. So, but we created, we created creative tensions so that we could actually deal with, um, um, with introversion because you could just move and still feel like you were participating, I think. So in Colin, I, I guess I'd say I have like a, my mom, my great grandmother, like it's like, I like, it's like, I like, like, all, like all the amazing women on on my team like who who just like have me, have my back every day like it's like it's like it's just like um in fact like my designer acts more like the chief <laughs> the ceo like she's the one who's just like no you're not going to do that you're going to do this and i'm like you're right it's like it's like so so yeah i i i, I kind of I, I take it where i can get it my dog was a great mentor she taught me a lot about how to make great conversations um so <laughs> i love it um well, I think we are going to switch into Q and A, and I want to leave the last question after we do this to how do we make a conversation effective um, on Zoom? So, does that sound good? Switch to Q and A, and then we'll end on the what we all do while we're stuck on our screens. 
That, that sounds great. And then just so you know, I just dropped the name of the um, book in uh, Giving Waste of Values is the name of the book um, of my friend, Mary Gentile. She's a, she's a program at Darden and uh, get out there, like go, go join it or, or give it money. It, it, it needs, she's raising money right now, so. That's great. Gotta check that one out too, guys. Um, let's see. All right, so up first, Steven, what are some things that we should be aware of when having a first conversation with someone? What habits or behaviors are turnoffs for the other party and how can we avoid them? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, um, one of the things I think that we should do is, is recognize that it's like, it's okay to have silence, even if it's sort of awkward. In fact, sometimes silence, as we said, is a, is a good thing. And so it's like, so don't, don't feel like you have to kind of force the conversation. You can keep it really simple, like sort of just say like, what's your name like it's like like it's like where are you from like don't ask don't ask things like don't ask what do you do right that's like that's that is that is a turnoff for a lot of people um uh i had a here's a um oh hey robert how you doing <laughs> it's like on on it's appropriate to interrupt the conversation yes welcome we'll talk about that in a second um but it's like i i feel like um one of the things that that is really interesting in um uh shoot what was i saying colin i was talking about um oh so one person at, at, at um i think it was at harvard was like listen i gotta know if this guy is the right guy like for day one so how do i like on my first date how do i know if he's if he's the right guy for me and one of the things i recommended doing is playing a game with with them because if you play a game and like he cheats he's not the right guy right it's like it's like if, if you play a game and like and he always lets you win probably not the right guy either. Like, it's like, you, you need to kind of like, you, like, I mean, you have to decide what, what, what you want and, and what you're looking for. Hey, can I, do you mind if I ask a question for my friend, Robert, who um, who just asked a question about- Yeah, of course. And then, um, yes, yeah, someone had you back out there. Uh, somebody said, yeah, don't ask what you do. And I, I was actually invited to a networking event pre-COVID um, that was like a no small talk party. So you weren't allowed to talk about work, the weather or like traffic or something like that. And like, Literally, you would get put into a different room if you did. <laughs> well, I mean, let's be honest. Weather is the most interesting conversation you can have right now. So it's like, it's like so it's like, like, I, I, like, honestly, I could talk about weather all day long. Like, it's like, but it's like, but yeah, I mean, I ask them what their favorite Disney movie was. You know, it's like, I ask, you know, I ask them when, when, when the last time they fell in love was, or I, I don't, there's so many other interesting, more interesting questions. Robert, you asked, is it ever, is there ever, um, is it ever appropriate to interrupt a conversation? And yes, absolutely. In fact, one of the things that I recommend is building interruption into a conversation. Um, so basically what, what happens is, um, it, like I often will build what I call a time bomb about 45 minutes into a conversation where it's like, I'm like, okay, we're gonna have 45 minutes of silence or 45 seconds of silence. Um, and then we're gonna come back to what we're actually supposed to be doing. Um, I talk about, I call these things peaceful interruptions, Robert. Um, like a really simple example is, if someone's running on and on, you might say, hey, do you mind if I just, we take like a 45 second bio break and that's enough for us to reset the conversation. Um, one of the most powerful um, resets in a conversation I ever saw was a woman, Amelia, um, Amelia Winger Bearskin, who basically, um, we, we were in a conversation that was going downhill. We were having a big battle about what, what empathy meant. Like it was like, and, and we, were, we couldn't agree on the term empathy. And she raised her hand and she was like, do you mind if I ask a question or if, if I say something? And we were like, please. So she, she, stood, she stood up and she sang us a lullaby. Very short. In fact, if you go to Instagram, you can see she, um, she did it a couple weeks back on Instagram Live TV, but um, the lullaby was like gorgeous. And, it's, and um, she reset the conversation because lullabies are basically talking about how short a time we have on earth that actually we may wake up tomorrow or we may not, all these kinds of things. And so suddenly you had all these really powerful people and they were like, oh, wait a second, we are wasting our time like fighting over a word. Let's not lose a day for a word, right? And so, so Robert, yes, but just be elegant. Like it's like, or, or, or design it, you know, think, think about interruptions. Like, um, like don't, don't just say like, I'm gonna stop you unless that's your role. Like if you, if you said my, my role here is I'm gonna stop you. Then, then you can say, I'm going to stop you here and we're going to go on to something else. Yeah, I think it's an art for sure. Um, let's see, Rubenstein asks, uh, 
do you say that a great product that's, I guess, very different, um, doesn't need a pitch, but simply needs to be shown? Ooh, as a designer, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this one. You know, I, I, I tend to think yes. I mean, it's like, so first of all, I'm not into pitch so much, um, uh, you know, in, in general. I'm, I'm not into the, the word pitch. And I'm not really into the word. I'm not. I'm not really into the into the notion of it. It's pitches are inherently um, uh, unequal. Like you have to do a lot of training to get good at pitching. Like it's like it's like I, I personally, frankly, would rather just see the person talk to me for for a period of time um, and tell me about it. However, if they have a product, um, I'm trying to think if I have a really great product around. But um, I do, but it's boxed up. It's too bad. I'd pull out. I'd pull out this amazing quilted jacket from this fashion designer um, that was in the New York Times lot two weeks ago that I that I basically just got here. And he's oh, like- you finally got it, huh? Yeah, he's, exactly. He's like a 23 year old, ugh, a shoot. I, we could do unboxing. He's a 23 year old um, a, a fashion designer who, um, who I just, I, by the way, I just reached out to and was like, hey, I wanna, I, want, I wanna get some of your stuff. And he like, we had a call the next day and like, and, and we got a bunch of his stuff. So um, don't be afraid to reach out to, to powerful people or people that you admire. Um, that you'd be surprised what you get back. Awesome. Um, so on the, the pitch side of things, <clears throat> it's more about the story than the showing of the object, right? I think it's about the story. It's about your story. It's about people. People do want to see your passion for it. Like, I think it's really important that, it, that it's like that, that your passion shows through. Um, so I'm, I'm actually unboxing this product while we while we sat. So it's the talk. So it's like so. I, I think I think that actually um, it, it it does make a difference. Um, so I, I I would I would say that yeah. But but it's like I also feel like it's like let's see you. Let's let's understand why it is that you think you came up with this. Why you think this is important. Let's see your team. Like why why do they think it's important? Um, it's not gonna happen. <laughs> I, can't, I can't get this. As you're, uh, yeah, and as you're unboxing, uh, advice that I've often heard people tell entrepreneurs is uh, pitching is. I mean, of course, there's an information that you've got to get across the table, right? That investors want to hear, or even customers want to hear. Ooh, we're 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 live, unboxing it. Okay. Um, but but I think part of it is having a com opening the floor for a conversation versus just spinning through this scripted reel where you've got you you went through all this information and you live and breathe this information all day long, and then at the end of the if, at the end of the presentation, if nobody asks any questions. That's probably a bad signal. If that's, they want to learn more and have a conversation, it's better. That's that's right. If you handle a pitch in a really good way, this is this cute little shirt from the surfer. That's like he, 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 it's all quilted. Anyway, so but there's a lot of stuff in here. But um, uh, if you handle it the right way, you'll actually find that um, the people actually aren't going to want to end in a half an hour. Like people, people are going to want to sort of like sort of stay stay on and linger longer. You might actually find that people are more willing to be like, oh well not now but let's talk later like I, I think i have ways that that can that can help you so I, I think it's like it's a really important thing i mean i think again when i did this public um board thing last week i was like clearly enthusiastic about the product and they're like well whether or not you're on the board we actually would like to pay you to come back and talk to us about what you what you think we should be doing and i'm like that's good too i'm happy to do that as well so that's great well we've got some other questions but we're getting close to the top of the hour um, let's see. Lewis has a question about presenting to an audience. Um, in addition to being genuine, what else can you do to help create a meaningful discussion with your audience? Lewis, this is a really good one, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time on it. Sorry. It's like, so I write in the book about a thing called script spotting, which is recognizing when there are implicit scripts, either in a space, in the rules of a conversation, in the agenda of a conversation, and getting good at kind of deciding, are you cool with those rules or not? Like, or do you want to change the rules? And so, I myself would do lectures. I do lectures live all the time, like for in, in big auditoriums. And I don't like the script of a thousand person auditoriums, right? So the script basically says, I'm an expert, I'm behind a podium. Like I'm like, I'm, you know, it's like, it's like you, you're gonna listen to me for 45 minutes or as long as I want. And so what I would do is I would say like, I want no podium. I want a lavalier. I want a stool that I can sit on so like we can actually talk. Um, there's going to be slides, but there'll be, there'll be no speaker's notes. I won't be reading. I'll just be talking extemporaneously. And um, I also would wear a suit coat, um, jeans, and often shoes that slipped off. And so about a third of the way through the conversation, I would take off my shirt coat and roll up my sleeves. And then if the conversation was really good, I would actually take off my shoes 
um, because I don't really like wearing shoes very often. Um, and then if the conversation was going really well, like I might come down to the audience and sit and talk with people as, as we're going. And what I was doing was gradually eroding a script that I didn't want to follow, which was, I'm an expert, you have to listen to me. And and it really worked. Like by the end, the audience was just like, they felt like they were like warmed and connected in a way that was really powerful. So I think that's a great question. Thank you. I've seen tons of podium moments where this happens <laughs> in the audience, right? People are falling asleep. It's like, yeah, it's like, I'm like, I'm like, I want the house lights up because if someone's sleeping, I'm going to come and wake them up. Like it's, like, it's just like, that's the way it is. Just sit down next to them. And then everyone in the audience is in on the joke. I am, by the way, Colin, the person who always gets called up on the stage when you're actually like at a theater show and they're like, and now we're gonna bring some to the audience. And I'm like, it's always me. I don't know why that happens. It's terrible. <laughs> it's probably because you're actually listening to the person. Yep. Um, let's see, we've got some, this is a long one. I'm trying to get through um, these questions and we've got two minutes. <clears throat> can I talk about the pandemic really quick for, for one minute? Yeah, let's, let's end with that. So yeah. how can our entrepreneurs and everybody on that, on this Zoom have effective conversations on a digital platform like Zoom yeah. this time. Well, so here's the thing, and this will be done with this for a while. My, I have four principles. I have a chapter in the book because my published publisher made me write a chapter about this in March um, last year. And basically um, four things that I, that I say, which is um, break the rules, break all of them. The rules weren't set for these mediums. So don't, don't feel like you have to live by them choose the medium to suit the message. So sometimes like if you're thinking about firing somebody, consider like going for a walk if they're in the same city with you, um, um, and you and you can do that or consider like doing it on the phone, like calling them up, don't do it by Slack, like obviously, um, like ha have, ha which many people have done. Um, uh, like that's a very intimate kind of way to have a conversation. Um, and then it, designing human in, so show yourself, like, this is where I live. You know, it's like, it's, it's actually it looks better if you see other depending on other places. And this is how I look, you know, it's like, there's no age filtering on me. I'm like, I'm, I'm old. Um, and then, um, like, well, number three, that's good enough. <laughs> it's like, no, what's the, what's the last one? <laughs> you get a minute. I, I, you know, I can never remember what the fourth of anything is. It's like, it's a, the, the last thing was, um, oh, um, assess, it's actually the first thing assess and commit or don't. So if you can't commit to the conversation, it's the same thing as in the book, like basically um, go back and, and, and take it out of your calendar and give yourself some time back. Sound advice. Yeah. Um, and I'm glad to have committed to this conversation. So thank you so much, Fred, for joining us today to share your insights with our community. Um, everybody out there, here's Fred's Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and um, a way to check out the book and learn how to make meaningful conversations. Fred, really appreciate you joining us today. And I've had the pleasure of reading the book. It's really great and um, fun to have a conversation about making conversation. Thanks, Colin. It's been an honor. And by the way, please reach out if anyone has any questions or thoughts or needs some help on any pitches. I'm always happy to help. So Amazing. Well, thank you again, Fred, and looking forward to staying in touch. Uh, to all of you out there in Zoom land, we've got some great upcoming webinars. So on March 17th, we've got SPACs in 2021. What's going on with those? And on March 23rd, we've got how to expand and do international business and uh, international markets with Talal Rafi. So hope you can join us for those. Thank you all for joining us today. And we hope to see you online soon. Thanks again, Fred. Bye.